and that, that's kind of the key, key difference. They went for Immutable first, we went for Atomic first. Uh, that's why it took us five years, and they've got like great marketing campaigns at the moment. <laughs> it's taken us a lot fucking longer. Mm-hmm. But now we're approaching um, the whole, can we do Immutable, can we make it work efficiently side of things. So to make ours Atomic first without the Immutable side, that kind of meant we still had to emulate that imperative behavior. like. I install a package, it's there, I apply updates, it's done in real time. That's what we needed to make work first. And that was kind of hard. And that We needed to create a new format for that, and we needed to make sure that we could survive over time with upgrades, or if the, the container format changed in any way, or if we added any new features, we had to make sure that this thing could basically update for the rest of time. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's versioning in the header itself, and each individual payload has versioning as well. And, we're going to be doing um, what they call epoch bumps. So effectively, you'll only update to the latest supported version of the repository. And then at that point, you will see no more updates until you're on the new version. Of the and then keep going, keep going, keep going. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it is different from mm. our street deployments. And that the idea is to present what, to all intents and purposes, is a classic Linux distribution, which is composable and currently mutable. Um, but using all the new tricks, which is, you know, like have it atomic and have content addressable storage, have offline rollbacks and things like that. So that was, that was the hard part to be honest with you. Right. Cause I, one of the problems I see with these, it's not just OS tree. It's with a lot of the other approaches as well. There, there are these weird distros where if you're someone who only lives in a web browser, totally fine. And if you're someone who is really, really advanced with Linux, you can generate your own custom images, and it's great for you. But for those people in the middle, I just... Cloud native. Yeah. I, that, that's... A, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, for those people Why in the middle... Why is it mid- on my desktop? <laughs> <laughs> for those, those people in the middle who don't really know what they're doing, like, it, it, I, I find it to be more confusing, and mm. I... I get it for devices like the Steam Deck, where it's a, it's a, it's a appliance device. It's yeah. you can install just regular Linux on it, but it's just a gaming handheld console. And if you use it like that, yeah. great idea. But I just don't really ever sealed see. Delivery. Sorry. The sealed delivery task mm, specific. Mm, mm. Yeah, totally makes sense. It's basically OTA. I. The only way I see the current OS tree approach really working is the the way it's, they're, they're trying to get it to work, which is going heavy down the, you know, if you want to install applications, you'll be installing it through Flatpak, which I guess like it's an, it's an approach that seems to be working, but I don't know if it's going to. I, I I just don't see it covering every use case. Like that's that's the main point there. Yeah, I mean. Flatback, definitely, it does have its use. Like, Mm -hmm. it does make things easier. But if we're at the point where everyone is shoving everything into Flatback, which the idea was, you know, everyone really, really got upset by Canonical having their own store and this whole centralization strategy, which really was a way to to build build engagement with publishers and developers, really, because they wanted a central centralized platform to work. So, I mean, that kind of helped with Flatback. That and te- the technical underpinnings of Flatback were obviously way ahead of uh, Snap. Mm-hmm. But we're now at a point that using Flatback means using Flathub. Mm-hmm. Whatever way you look at it. So you are basically adding another three or four versions of this meta distro that exists on Flathub through all of these packages. So the argument originally was, why should we package all these things? Because you know, we, we have our own distro, they should all be up in this magical cloud store type contraption, but it's mm-hmm. basically another fucking distro now. I mean, I if do you really see... look at it, how many apps are packaged up, it's basically another distro. From the developer perspective, like, of the, like, upstream application developer, I understand wanting to have a central location your application is distributed from, because mm-hmm. if you have people who are reporting bugs, and you know they're using the flat pack, you know... The dependencies they have you know the mm. version they're running it makes your job considerably easier yeah testing matrix basically yeah 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 like but i i i can also i also see from the downstream perspective as well there and 
don't know. I use flat packs in uh, some places. Like my OBS right now is a mm. flat pack, and usually if the if the upstream developers have an official distribution and that is a flat pack, usually that's what I'm going to go with. But mm. I, I don't think it is the be all and end all solution. No, you still kind of need you need to account for some level of distribution integration as well because mm -hmm. some distros do things differently something weird i mean if you look at serpent we've got a mandate for things being stateless on and without configuration and mm -hmm. making sure we can roll back offline and so some things in terms of the core experience have to be packaged up and managed by the package manager and not using say like butterfly snapshots and things like that because then everything comes out of sync mm -hmm. um but yeah I, I, I can see arguments for and against. Um, I think utilities and apps, sure, but I think the basics should all be provided for by the distro. Mm -hmm. So in terms of your your productivity tools, your office suites, and you know, it shouldn't be like having forty of every single thing, but having two or three of each thing. So there's a little bit of choice, and those are well integrated and sensible and tested then yeah. But as for the wider ecosystem, God well. Mm -hmm. That's that's my view on it anyway. I don't want to go to Flatpak or Firefox or Thunderbird. Or I want to make sure they're they're deeply integrated by my distro and you know, know that they're working with the, the security configuration and I haven't got to go online to do anything with it, you know. Mm -hmm. Basic shit like that. Sure. No that, that that's that's totally un <clears throat> that's totally understandable. Um <clears throat> So, <laughs> why do you? Th here's here's a question. Maybe maybe you don't have an answer for this one. But why do you think there has been this focus on immutability first over the atomic updates from a lot of these other approaches? Like, why do you think the OS tree approach has become such a popular way of of building some of these distros? Um, I would love to say that it was primarily technical reasons, but. I don't really think it is. I think quite a bit of it has to do with the Octo story, um, industry sponsorships and politics, I think, powered a lot of that success, if we're quite honest. Mm -hmm. um, because there's a, there's a whole world trying to get away from the, the old BitBake way of doing things. And, you know, and a few years ago, there was a little bit of drama, and then you had, like, the known way of doing things, and that sort of took off with relevant sponsorship. Mm -hmm. Um it also makes sense, obviously, for Flatpak way of doing things. And I think I think it was something that was seen as technically more feasible to pull off. Right. Given the use cases in mind. I think I haven't read as much on it, but I think if anyone had looked at, say, what we were doing with Serpent and that, they would have said, this is going to require far too much upfront investment to pull off. Well, you spent the last results, 20 minutes to... talking about how it works, so I think you might be right there. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to see results and your basic priority was, you know, like, here's our defined use cases, mm -hmm. this is what corporates approve. We have a, a sealed delivery, verified updates, and that, that works, you know, like, in terms of do we meet update safety? I think it does It tick all of those boxes. And I think Serpent's kind of in a weird one because everyone's going to say, well, we've already got OS3, we kind of don't need it. And there's DistroBox and there's RPM OS3 and there's OCI and things like that. And I agree all of those things do exist. And for a lot of people that might not want to use Serpent, that, that's also fair enough. But it's also about Serpent having the bottle to push forward with things where other people don't want to invest the resources because it, it doesn't see quick enough returns. And that's kind of where Serpent really uh, because it's taken a lot of time to build all of the aspects of the tool and um, take for example boot management mm -hmm. without scripts and that's that's the sort of things because some of our rules say like being stateless so you we we can't force etc files to exist there's no etc default group we have to pretend like we don't know where the bootloader or boot partition even exists okay. we're not allowed to remember it because it will go against stateless so um, my install of Serpent, there's absolutely no file anywhere to tell Moss or any tool where the boot partition is. It's not allowed to know. So that becomes a hard problem to solve immediately. How the fuck do you find it? 
Um, so that was one of the projects, BLS for me, which is bootloader, bootloader specification for me. Mm-hmm. And because it's system D related, it also is pronounced blasphemy. Because why would you not? So that's the the core crate that we use at the moment. It's largely a successor to my early work with Clear Boot Manager. Mm-hmm. But the, the TLDR is the given given the proposed local system state that the the contents of the boot and or ESP partitions mm-hmm. should be entirely reproduced. That includes the boot order itself, any configuration files, down to knowing what the command line configurations to pass to it are, what the, the topology of the disk is, if there's, you know, is there a UUID for looks that needs passing in because you've got an encrypted container halfway between and What's the partition UUID on GPT for that root disk? You know, all of this shit that's normally just encoded to a file, etc, default group, or somewhere similar, and just saved across time and upgraded with a bash script. We've actually had to go a little bit further in, and if the variables are provided uh, over AFI virus, then we can query them from system D boot because, hey, you booted us, thank you. We'll still verify them because we're not taking your word for it. Mm-hmm. Um, then we'll query the topology of the, the root file system. So we'll basically walk back through the device tree and actually scan the first few bytes of every disk that we find to figure out what the super block is and extract the UUIDs. And so we actually find out what every file system on the way up is, including if there's a Lux2 container, if there's any LVM2 stuff involved, if CFT4, EXF, XFS, the whole lot. We've actually got Rust based super block paths just for all of those. Um, and then yeah, we write out all these configuration files, whack them all out, automatically discover the ESP. If we can't find it or we don't trust system deboot, which is also both two good policies, um, it will actually fall back to reading the G- uh, the partition table itself, and then finding the tagged ESP and X- um, and X bootloader using the UUIDs. <laughs> so it's insane. If you was to propose this, like at a company and say. This is the thing we're going to do. We're going to create a package manager that also knows how to do stuff with boot managers and find out what file system you're running. Um, but it's all allowed to have configuration files. Fuck off, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> you can never propose it. Mm-hmm. So, that's, again, that's basically the gap that Serpent's filling. You know, like these, these long term, how do we fix how we distribute Linux? How do we make it reproducible? Not in terms of the bit, the bit for bit byte stuff. You know, like build reproducible. Of course, that's important. That will come in time. Mm-hmm. But how can I have a definition of a system that I can reproduce on any given system and know that it's always going to turn out the right way? Right. That part is an interesting problem that I don't think there's much attention on. The attention so far has effectively been the immutable image. It's a sealed image. We know the difference between image A and image B. But when the user is composing those images in any given environment, how do you then know that those things are still going to work? Mm-hmm. And that's sort of where Serpent fits in, the weirdo. 